I was tagged by Rod at Kwood Survival. Uh, Rod lives in Alaska. He's got an excellent channel. I can highly recommend it. Um, the tag was based on a video that he did, which was uh, skill versus gear. And he was basically saying it's a fork in the road. Can you decide which is more valuable, more important, which is going to get you through uh, in a difficult time, or even on a, on a regular camping trip? Are you going to rely more on the technology of modern gear, uh, or are you going to rely more on old-fashioned skills, knowledge of bushcraft, and uh, you know all of the, the the old school ways of getting things done out in the bush? Um, is it really that simple? You know, can we just make a decision? In today's modern world, we are so integrated. All of us, even living way up in the north here, we're so integrated with with modern technology. Can we just draw a line? Well, let's go through this video together, and uh, we'll take a look at some of the different possibilities, and then I want to hear what you have to say. Uh, when we get to the comment section at the end, I'd like to—I'd love to hear your choices of why you think that that would work best. Come along, let's have a look at it, see what we find. There's no denying the fact that snowmobiles and technology in general can take us farther and faster with less physical strain than you could ever go on foot. But there's a price you have to pay. Not only the cost of the snowmobile, which is actually quite high, uh, there's the maintenance, the fuel, insurance. There's always the, the possibility though of a breakdown. Uh, they can run out of fuel, they can fail, and if they've taken you further, faster, uh, if they do fail, they're going to leave you somewhere far, far away on foot. So, you know, that's something that has to be taken into consideration. Another big part of operating a snowmobile is the noise. Um, they make quite a lot of noise, some more than others. But when you're operating a snowmobile, there's very little chance that you're going to see much wildlife and you miss the natural sounds and, and you break the peace and quiet beauty of the area you're in. On the positive side, they allow you to carry a lot more gear. You can take a small sleigh, as I do behind mine. You can carry safety equipment and you can carry uh, the makings to have a, a little cup of tea on the side of the, of the trail as you travel. So, you know, it's a trade-off, and this is what makes it difficult to say, I would take this, or I absolutely wouldn't. It's never that simple. You always have to, to, to weigh the possibilities of what you can do uh, compared to what you can't do when you're using a piece of equipment. That's even better, almost. I don't know whether to drink it or just hug it. Hmm. That's hot. Oh, that's good. Oh, that's good. Ah, yes. I don't use my snowmobile just on trails, the groom trails where you buy a pass. My snowmobile is basically to get me ice fishing or get me places that I can't get easily otherwise. You, as I said, can travel long distances very quickly and get to some very remote areas where you can get some very excellent fishing and you can also cross areas that you can't really get to in the summer. In the summertime everything is swamps and beaver ponds whereas in the winter time you have the opportunity to cross those because everything is frozen and you can pass right over top of it with with only minimal effort. He's a little bit small but he was pretty badly hooked so we kept him anyways. So that's our so here we are with another method of travel. Snowshoes have been around for centuries. Who can imagine when the first snowshoes were, were invented? But once again, there's a natural beauty, a calmness, certainly a quietness, where you can move through the forest, see the animals, hear the birds, and just enjoy things in peace and quiet without disturbing the whole countryside for miles around with the sound of an engine. Uh, just a, a very peaceful way to travel. The four-wheelers serve the very same purpose uh, in the summertime. They allow you to travel long distances with relative ease and they allow you to carry heavy equipment with you and when you're going into a bear camp or you're out moose hunting, uh, you can always bring your moose back 
without uh, having to pack it out piece by piece. As you can see, the, you know, some of these trails are extremely rugged and this is miles and miles back into the bush. And yet, with a little bit of caution and a good winch on the front, the four-wheeler will take me for, for miles back into these places and allow me to bring the bear or the moose back out with me. And it's just a good place, a uh, good opportunity to explore and find new areas, perhaps new areas where I may want to hunt. Um, I can, of course, get to some rivers and, and ponds and lakes by four-wheeler in the summer, so that will offer me some fishing as well. And uh, But then the same drawbacks. They're noisy, they burn fuel, they're subject to breakdown, and breakdowns can leave you in a lot of nasty places so far away that you have an awful time getting back. All the trails here and these little bridges that you're about to see are all built and maintained by ourselves and it's, it's just something that we do to continue to get around. As I mentioned, there's also the fun factor. There's no question about it that getting back into some of these remote places uh, can be an awful lot of fun. You can see a lot of very cool areas that, again, you won't otherwise get to. There can be some challenges along the way, as we see here. Um, you know, it's not always smooth going and trying to build and maintain these rickety old bridges way, way back in the bush is a lot of work. You bring in materials, you, you know, it's just a lot of work. But then the, uh, the benefits are on the other side, you know, you can get there. And uh, hopefully we'll get there here because this uh, bridge, so to speak, doesn't look that great. As I mentioned, there is the downside, and there's times when you're just up to your butt in muck. Um, this four-wheeler is sitting right up on the skid plates, and our four wheels are just spinning in the mud. And that's where you really want to have a good strong winch, 50 feet of cable, and a couple of 25-foot tow straps, because there's no other way out, and it's a long walk home without your machine. Operating a boat is basically the same as any of the other pieces of equipment. They're expensive to buy, relatively expensive to maintain, and they burn quite a lot of fuel. It seems nowadays that uh, more and more the companies are fading away from the uh, idea of being the best that they can be and the best quality product and building up their company name. And, you know, it's all the board of directors cutting pennies to get profit margins up there. And it's leaving the uh, it's leaving the quality out they're adding gadgets and flashing lights and buttons to all the different items that they sell but not so much the quality when it comes to GPS's uh, I'm gonna take my compass over a GPS anytime because I know it's going to work and that's one of the problems that I have with all the gadgets canoes on the other hand uh, have a beauty and an elegance of their own they have the same basic design and lines that they had for hundreds of years when the natives first started building birch bark canoes. This canoe that I built is square stern and it's only 10 feet long but I built it for a specific purpose and it serves that purpose very well. It's beautiful, it's quiet, it's lightweight, this one's just fiberglass and it's, uh, it's just a pleasure to be out in it. You can enjoy nature, uh, you, can, you can drift silently right up to close to where the animals are. It's just an absolute pleasure to be out there. It also takes you back to some places uh, where you'll just, again, never see it. There's some beautiful photography available, and here's a sample of it here. And then you get to the other side with a little portage, and you go on again. And you can go on for almost indefinitely uh, with portages. Because so many companies are putting all their efforts into finding flashy new products and gadgets that will take your money, rather than researching and developing those products into something of quality, uh, <clears throat> it's getting to the point excuse me, where there, there's very little, really in my opinion, um, that's either super expensive or it's just not worth having. Um, it's going to let you down and it's going to fail when you need it the most and these things are not the type of thing I want to have in my pack and I see this constantly on different uh, uh, videos on these YouTube channels where there's just nothing but endless 
um, gadgets being shown. This is the knife that I made. There's a lot of satisfaction in making it yourself and I know the quality of it. I know the durability of it. Um, not everybody can do it, but it gives you some good satisfaction. Now, now comes the time for me to tag three people to carry on this quest for what works, what doesn't, and everybody's going to have a different opinion, of course. The first person I'm going to tag is Tom from East Grand Woodsman. Tom is a very old school outdoorsman, a woodsman in the truest sense, and I have a pretty good idea what he's going to bring to the table here, but uh, I'm going to let him put it in his own words. Uh, he's got an excellent channel, East Grand Woodsman. Make sure you check it out. Uh, I'll put a link in the description and uh, by all means check out Tom's channel. The second channel that I'm going to tag on this is Light 'em Up Outdoors. And Chip is a, a, a very good outdoorsman, um, a hunter, and he has a lot of experience in the outdoors. He's going to bring, I, I, he's a little bit newer to me, I've known him for a while, I've watched his channel for a while, but uh, I'm quite curious to see uh, his take on this. I'm sure it will be somewhat similar, but uh, we'll soon find out, I guess. So again, I'll put a link in the description for Chip from Light 'em Up Outdoors. My third tag is going to be Patriot Farm. And Darlene has, uh, I'm sure, quite a different point of view on this, which is one of the main reasons I'm looking forward to hearing about uh, her point of view on it. Uh, unlike us, she's not, um, a, well, a woods person in the same sense, but she's definitely a homesteader. Um, she's definitely, she raises her own animals, cans her own food. Uh, she definitely has that homesteading, that true homesteading spirit. And because of the fact that you do your canning, uh, she has a butter churn and things like that. So I'm sure she's going to have some opinions on um, what she prefers. And it, it's all a time thing, you know. We all know that the, the electronics and the techniques that we get from uh, fancy machines is so much faster, uh, so much less physical work. But uh, let's find out what uh, Darlene's experience will be with that and her opinion. Everybody have a great one. Here we go. Well, I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope that at least it's got people thinking. And uh, let's, let's put a little bit more effort and thought into what we put in our packs, our, our 72 hour packs, our overnight packs, especially the packs that we should be carrying when we're just out for the day. Um, a lot of times when people are out for only just for a few hours, they don't carry a pack. And if anything happens, and it often does, that's when you, you know, you're, you're, you're really stuck because you have really very little with you. You weren't expecting it. You should always have something. And uh, that pack, as I was saying, should have something of decent quality in it. So everybody, uh, have a great evening, and we'll see you down the trail.